Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Immunogene Therapeutics and Hematological Cancers, How Science Drives Study Strategy. I'm Lisa Henderson, the Editorial Director for Applied Clinical Trials, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Applied Clinical Trials and sponsored by Premier Research. Premier Research is a leading clinical development service provider that helps highly innovative biotech, specialty pharma, and medical device companies transform breakthrough ideas into reality. The company has a wealth of experience in the execution of global, regional, and local clinical development programs with a special focus on addressing unmet needs in areas such as analgesia, dermatology, medical devices, neuroscience, oncology, pediatrics, and rare disease. Premier Research operates in 84 countries and employs 1,100 professionals, including a strong international network of clinical monitors and <coughs> excuse me, project managers, regulatory, data management, statistical, scientific, and medical experts. They are focused on smart study design for advanced medicines that allow um, for life-changing treatment. And to learn more, you can visit them at www.premier-research.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small green icon in the upper right-hand corner of the slide window, or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the event. And if you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window. And now we're going to move to today's presenters. I'd like to introduce you to Luke Gill and Colin Hayward. Luke Gill has an extensive scientific background and more than 20 years of drug development experience. Specializing in oncology, he has led numerous global CRO management teams and provided strategic assessment, management, and oversight of study enrollment and program metrics. Prior to joining Premier Research in 2015, Mr. Gill was Director of Global Project Management for Hematology and Oncology at PPD, overseeing design and delivery of clinical development plans across multiple indications and specializing in early phase oncology. He also served as Assistant Project Management Director at PPD, was CRO Alliance Program Director for Merck Sorono, and has held positions at Pfizer, Park Davis, Astra, and Glaxo. Mr. Gill holds a master's degree in neuro and molecular pharmacology from the University of Bristol, a bachelor's degree in biological sciences from the University of the West of England, and an MBA specializing in strategy and international ex enterprise from the Open University in the UK. And Dr. Colin Hayward is Premier Research's top medical expert, providing global leadership for patient safety, scientific and ethical governance, and delivery of exemplary customer service. Possessing a rare combination of business and scientific expertise, Dr. Hayward entered the pharmaceutical world with a focus on anesthesia and intensive care after a career in hospital medicine. Using his expertise in local medical affairs and pharmacovigilance, Dr. Hayward became the international medical leader uh, at Roche, developing innovative and medical marketing strategies for products in supportive care, anemia, and oncology. In 2007, he joined the board of Prism Ideas Limited. After helping grow Prism and earning a Queen's Award for business, he became, he became no, I'm sorry, he came to, he didn't become them, no, he came to Premier Research in 2012 as Vice President of Medical Affairs, providing round-the-clock medical support to ensure that customers' multi-million euro drug development projects met their goals and adhered to stringent safety rules. And he left the company to serve as European Medical Director for Myriad Genetics and returned in 2015 to assume the newly created Chief Medical Officer position. Dr. Hayward holds a degree in medicine from Guy's in St. Thomas's Hospital in London. 
So thank you both for joining us today. And uh, gentlemen, you can get started. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just moving the slides along. Hey, good morning or afternoon, everybody. Thank you for making time to join today uh, in our discussions. This, by the way, this is Luke Gill. Um, I've got Colin with me as well here. Uh, so Colin and myself and a number of our colleagues here at Premier Research are working with a number of biotechs with cutting edge technology in solid tumors and hematology, heme malignancies. <clears throat> and we wanted to share some of our knowledge and thoughts behind study strategy, design, and the critical science that drives the success uh, of a study in the heme area. So what I wanted to do was just highlight some of the key learning objectives from today's discussion. And what I hope is you'll come away with some inspiration um, that you can apply uh, over the coming year to your own uh, world of clinical research. <clears throat> so they include uh, the ingredients for study planning and delivery, including the endpoints of, of the study. Um, be able to call out some of the operational challenges based in achieving conclusive data. We want to touch upon a data-driven approach to ensuring the right sites and countries participate in your studies. Um, and not a lot is said about this one, but really the strengths needed for patient retention. And lastly, if you're a biotech in an early phase oncology setting, what are the future direct trajectories in terms of light sourcing? What should you be looking for? So today's discussion is really set out broadly into five sections. <clears throat> An initial overview of gene therapy technology in, in um, the heme, heme oncology. The next two sections are the larger sections, and they cover planning and design. Um, and followed by sections specifically related to safety outcomes and management for adoptive cell transfer products and vaccines. And then we'll move on to an important section, as I said, in terms of site selection and patient engagement. And the last section will discuss the regulatory pathways with gene therapies and vaccines and immuno-oncology assets. So the first polling question. Awesome too. Thank you, Luke. So we, I'd like to ask the audience to participate in our first polling question. And you just need to click and enter, click and then hit submit your answers directly on the screen. And as you can see, the first question is, what development stage best describes your lead asset? And you're looking at preclinical, phase one, phase two, POC, phase three, and post-approval. And again, what development, what development stage best describes your lead asset? Preclinical, phase one, phase two, proof of concept, phase three, and post approval. And you can click and submit, and we'll just give you a couple more seconds. Okay, back to you, Luke. So actually, Colin here taking that over. So sorry about we'll that. Just go back. That's okay. Um, let's just have a look about what we have ongoing in this area right now. Um, so roughly, this is this is a sort of very very broad classification. Immuno oncology is leading the way in cancer therapies. We go to ASCO, and probably 80, 90 percent of our presentations there next year uh, or in June in Chicago will be immuno oncology based. And I broadly put them into the therapeutic cancer vaccines category. So here, where we're helping the body's own T cells to produce more T cells against that tumor. Um, and it's, it's really the, the nature of that, that vector, whether it's cell-based from, from tumor tissue, like uh, Cipolucel in prostate cancer, um, vector-based, virus-based. And I've included the oncolytic viruses in here. They could be a category of their own, certainly. So things like TVEC in melanoma to the adoptive cell transfer, where what we're trying to do is take T cells from the patient, expand those ex vivo, 
and then put those back to really have anti-cancer properties. Of course, the big ones this year are the, um, the two big CAR-T products, and we'll be using those as case examples throughout the presentation. Now, as many of you have just shown, in terms of where your particular products are in the development pathway, we can see this overview from ESMO recently about the number of immuno-oncology agents in development. Now, this gives us a number of challenges in delivering clinical trials, both from a practical and a strategic point of view. So, can we think about which indication we could go for? Now, if you're lucky enough that your target molecule has a number of different indications, um, that we can look at where the, perhaps the, the clinical trial environment is the least competitive. In addition, this causes competition for resource at sites and competition for patients as well. So the study planning becomes increasingly important. When we're looking at the strategy and going from single agent to combination, clearly there are over sort of 50,000 doublet combinations we could take with existing immuno-oncologies, not to mention all the chemotherapeutic agents and the single molecules that we could potentially partner with going down the line. We'll also see later on that the, there are important regional differences between particularly Europe, China, and U.S., in where these sites are going on and what we can do to potentially overcome those. So this is clearly where we're all trying to get to. We're trying to get to a approved gene therapy in oncology. So Novartis really taking the headlines with the first one there and obviously taking the headlines with the cost as well. But a lot of the cost is reflected in this complex pathway in terms of drug development and the complex pathway in terms of producing the molecule. So if we look at a, a very simplified version here, the product technology for the CAR T really does drive some of the challenges we see strategically in terms of delivery of clinical trials. So T cell collection from a patient, so a patient goes into a center, they're going to have to be at a center where there's leukapheresis uh, facilities there to separate out the T cells. Those T cells are then sent away, so there needs to be easy uh, expansion, ex vivo expansion of those T cells before being delivered back into the patient. And of course, the conditioning regimen, uh, plus or minus, will also potentially affect toxicity and tolerability and how long that patient has to stay in hospital. And as Luke alluded to earlier, the patient engagement strategy is not just the patient, but it's also the family engagement strategy. And if uh, anyone like me has visited relatives in hospital who've been undergoing transplantation, um, autologous or allogeneic transplantation, then we know what a strain that is for the family as well. So over to Lisa just for the second poll question. Thank you, Colin. And as you see, here is our second um, polling question audience for you to participate in. What class of technology best describes your lead asset? And you can click on the most uh, accurate and hit submit from your choices, cancer vaccines, viral vector vaccine, adoptive self-transfer, such as the CAR-T that Colin was just discussing, other immuno-oncology compound or non-immuno-oncology compound. And again, what class of technology best describes your lead asset? Cancer vaccines, viral vector vaccine, adoptive cell transfer, other immuno-oncology immuno compound, or a non-immuno-oncology compound. And click on the most appropriate and hit submit, and we'll give you a few more seconds to do that. And then I will pass it over to the experts at Premier Research. That's great. I think we have a real mix of uh, different challenges and also, you know, looking at some familiar faces on the phone, people from advocacy groups as well. So a real mix um, of interests across the board. And so we'll try and keep perspective as a general one that is applicable across the board. So clearly, next thing we want to go into is how are we going to plan our studies in this area, in the hematology setting? So I'll hand over to Luke just to talk about mechanism of action a little bit. Right. 
Uh, okay, so before we really get into the main planning design and strategy, I wanted to kind of highlight a couple of things. There's another presentation that we did on tumor biology, um, eye resistant solid tumors that you can go to and really look at um, you know, some of the uh, immune pathways and how they're affected by checkpoint inhibitors. And we're not going to go into that so much uh, in this presentation, but I did want to raise one point in that. You know, in terms of chimeric antigen receptors, uh, people talk about CAR T cell uh, cell therapy as such, but there's also TCR, and there is a difference between the manufacturer of uh, CAR T cells and TCRs, and it's highlighted on on this slide. But essentially, <clears throat> the T cell receptors are harder to isolate and engineer, and they have a, a low avidity and um, get into a stage of really having TCR technology versus some of the CAR-T uh, technology uh, is, is very different. And a number of biotechs um, specifically are targeting CAR-Ts or, or have TCR technology. And it's an important uh, differentiation because uh, some, some of the uh, TCRs uh, often you don't know until you get into uh, the human model um, what's going to happen. Uh, with the patients and you know the mechanisms and stuff, and you do get a number of halts to the studies as uh, you come across uh, patient death, etc. So before we get in, oops, I'm not sure. sorry, go ahead. So thanks, Luke. I guess where I always start when I'm trying to design <laughs> studies is, is see what the regulators are telling us about designing studies. Now, uh, I've I focused mainly on Europe and the US. Uh, that's where a lot of our customers are. It's their main focus, and we'll, we'll look at that a little bit later in terms of regulatory strategies as well. Um, if we look at the EMA, then they don't have any specifics right now um, in their cancer section about uh, immunomodulatory products standalone. It's included within all of their anti-cancer guidance. And you can see the reference down here, which is freely available uh, on the EMA website. And so immunomodulating products within that, including vaccines, are encompassed within their entire guidance. And of course, what they are talking about here is using these studies to establish safety and the dose schedule to induce a desired immune response. Um, still saying that dose finding studies generally require to establish the phase two. So really conventional in terms of um, what phase one is about. Now, some clarifications. Now, looking at a starting dose may be supported by the minimally anticipated biological effect level, the MABEL effect level. In addition, monitoring of immune response is also obviously key. Just one more word on the EMA position, particularly with CAR-T. Um, clearly, they have guidance with advanced medicinal products as well, which really does include genetically modified uh, cells. But there is specific guidance, again, a consultation paper where the end of the consultation was towards the end of last year, which we're expecting to be finalized. I'm sure many of you contributed, as we did, to this consultation to put in the position of where they felt it was relevant to clinical trial guidance. FDA has specific guidance for therapeutic cancer vaccines, both holistic guidance for the overall conduct, but also specific guidance for earlier and later phase studies. However, specifically, it does not mention CAR-T um, within this. In fact, it does say this does not relate to adopted T-cell therapy within the guidance. So handing back to Luke to talk some of the modeling approaches from the animal data. So I, I wanted to raise this point. Um, some of the early phase studies, <clears throat> and what, what, we, what we find with um, our biotech companies we work with is Really, we want to look at the in vivo and in vitro modeling that's done in terms of looking at um, uh, tumor size. And we start off with an animal model as such, and you're looking at um, modeling the dose schedules, uh, uh, whether uh, sequencing and or combinations of the immune therapies as such. And then as the studies progress through dose escalation, we're looking at predicting um, <clears throat> what the outcomes are going to be in terms of primary endpoints in progression-free survival or OS, et cetera, overall response rate. And it's important that uh, we really understand the tumor dynamics and survival outcomes and where we think success is going to lie. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll move to 
are, are really the, the crux of the conversation in terms of the first uh, <clears throat> CAR T cell therapy that was approved by the FDA in August 2017. And this, a little bit of background, this was developed by <clears throat> Carl Jim over at the University of Pennsylvania and licensed to Novartis. In April 17, uh, I'm going to call it CTLO 19 because I really can't say that, <laughs> the, the name for it apart from Chimera. Um, they, uh, so, so Novartis received breakthrough uh, therapy designation by the FDA for diffuse, uh, uh, relapsed refractory diffuse uh, large B-cell lymphoma. And then in the July, the FDA committee unanimously recommended it for approval in um, uh, acute lymphocytic lymphoblastic leukemia even, uh, <clears throat> for patients who do not respond adequately to uh, uh, treatments or have relapsed. <clears throat> so, in terms of this, this study design, essentially it's one of those uh, <clears throat> designs where there's a significant amount of operational expertise that's needed. And the patients that were selected were adult patients uh, with DLBL CL, and uh, essentially it was a, a, an international single arm open label study. and uh, Patients would progress following or are ineligible for autologous uh, hemopoietic stem cell transplants. Um, they shouldn't have had any prior anti-CD19 treatments or, or no active CNS um, involvement as such. And there was an independent uh, review committee that looked at the data. Uh, and essentially, the patients, as they went through screening, um, their cells were... Uh, were taken using apheresis and uh, sent off for manufacturing. And there was a 22-day period where uh, the manufacturing occurred, and those cells come back on site before uh, the patients starting start lymphodepletion and chemotherapy, and then they are infused. The interesting thing is um, that I found uh, that actually there was an inability to manage manufacture approximately nine patients of of the total, and a number of patients in in this study were actually treated in outpatient care as well as inpatient. Uh, and that's interesting in, in, in the fact that how do you uh, scale up your manufacturing process as such. However, the important part in terms of operationalizing you know, the manufacturing, the uh, collection of samples, and then um, coordinating the whole uh, patient screening uh, through to treatment uh, takes a number of steps, and uh, within Premio, we've done a number of, I think it's about seven programs with CAR T cell, um, cell therapy. And, you know, the protocols that need to be in place with the site, the physician, the patient, through to the manufacturing um, facility, through to the, you know, the sponsor as such, such is, it, it's quite significant. And um, the, the other interesting thing is that this study was obviously done in the U.S. and across a number of sites in Europe. And um, our friends at Novartis have started to develop a program where, oh, excuse me, moving on without saying, I'm moving on, um, a program to really set up uh, the management of these patients at a number of U.S. and European sites. So on, on this particular study, the, uh, the analysis from Juliet, the, the patients uh, with relapsed refractory DLBCL have a real poor prognosis. Um, you know, their response is available um, to potential salvage therapy is really, really low, and there's there's a complete lack of curative options in over 90% of these patients. Um, the interim analysis that was uh, performed in this part of the submission, we uh, Novartis had a, a 90, uh, sorry, a 59% overall response rate. When the the key point being 43% were complete responses, and the, the null hypothesis um, on this study was around 20, 25%, 20%. 20%. So Excuse me a second. I move to the next section. So, oops, excuse me. So, so in, in terms of licensing, I think the FDA approved 
um, the therapy uh, in relateral actually DBL, CBL. And in the EMEA, it was uh, it's also receiving approval for the same same indication, but also in young adults up to the age of 25 in relateral refractory B cell ALL. Um, I wanted to move on to the next section. So I think the most important part of this study as well, and, and I don't want to steal Colin's thunder for later slides, was around um, the treatment of uh, adverse events. Now, most patients, before I move on to that, uh, most patients who have received or achieved a complete response remained in remission. Um, and 74% of those patients were uh, relapse free after six months. Um, and while they were in that uh, uh, state, they didn't receive any transplants. Um, the responses were durable, and there were persistent blood transgene levels. And the point I was going to make was 58% uh, of the patients treated in this study actually had cytokine release syndrome. Uh, and that's critical, and I think uh, we'll come to that later on in the presentation. But uh, the key part of this is um, ensuring uh, sufficient protocols were in place to treat that cytokine storm and, you know, some of these patients required intubation, etc. But, um, you know, the outcomes were sufficiently robust to be able to get our first CAR-T um, approval by the FDA. So... This slide's interesting in that, um, so the traditional approach of endpoints, and I'm talking about resist and uh, resist 1.1 and, and in solid tumors, I, I, you know, the, the therapies were uh, as such are alkylating agents that, you know, uh, work pretty immediately, whereas the immunomodulation therapies essentially take a little longer to uh, a work and, and essentially the criteria for response um, with IR resist and I resist etc has moved on to take into account um, a longer duration uh, for responses and also pseudo progressions as such um, and it's very well defined, defined with the checkpoint inhibitors. So what I wanted to do with that, and I think this is the this is the interesting bit <clears throat> for me anyway. And this slide is split in two in terms of if you start off with the left hand side, I'll, I want to talk about you know the FDA is still kind of debating or choosing what are the right endpoints for immuno oncology studies. And what I wanted to throw out there, if you take uh, a patient who's had chemo and then upon progression takes an immuno oncology product, um, so effectively patients who come into your studies <clears throat> have chemo plus an IO versus IO, or um, where people come unstuck is where you have sequenced combos, uh, and the Checkmate 067 study, essentially <clears throat> what happened was that, you know, you, you're, you're not comparing IO to chemo, you're comparing IO to chemo plus IO, and it's important that you know this this is uh, understood when you're selecting your patient populations. And um, the other concept that I think is important, and you know, you'll see why, is around multiplicity in terms of your statistical analysis. In that you know you, you've got various confounding factors as your patients come into these early phase studies. And I, I don't want to detract from the fact that in these early phase studies we're looking at safety signals. Um, however, what we're trying to also do is look at the patient population you're going to be uh, considering for registration in the later phase studies. And, you know, obviously some of these studies are open label, et cetera, and if you're going for a pivotal uh, uh, blinded study, you need to have that factored in. So in terms of response criteria <clears throat> for hematology, uh, you know, it's based off of what we've learned from solid tumors. And essentially, you know, in uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitors, inhibitors have demonstrated, you know, clearly uh, impressive activity in a broad range of lymphoma histologies. You know, you've got FDG PET, CT imaging, um, and clinical findings that uh, are used for uh, determining progression of disease as such. And, um, 
and also part of that flare response and understanding what's a flare, et cetera. And so part of the Lugano classification obviously uses uh, is using for staging and response assessment and incorporates PETs and CT scans as a standard component for both staging and response. An FTD PET visity uh, is used for histologies and while CT is retained uh, for evaluation and other subtype therapies, um, treatments as such. What we have seen is rituximab and other biologics or immunomodulators uh, show some sort of flare response and linolenamide in CLL had about 15% of the patients with some sort of flare response and, you know, with a rapid onset of um, uh, node, uh, node increases and in pain and rash, lymphocytosis and bone pain as such. So it's not unusual. It has been seen in the hematological malignancies, but it's not very well uh, documented as such. So, <clears throat> so one of the things that uh, uh, a modified uh, Lugano criteria to you know take into account the flare responses has been uh, put in place in terms of lymphoma response to immunomodulatory therapy criteria. Uh, I want to say Lyric, but it's not. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, it retains some of the core concepts um, for iResist, I um, but incorpor incorporates them into lymphoma uh, criteria. And this is primarily accomplished through uh, a new concept or, or category termed indeterminate response um, and essentially it, there's three potential categories where you have an, an increase in overall tumor burden as assessed by the sum of the product of diameters um, you know greater than 50% um, increase in six measurable lesions after the first 12 weeks of therapy without clinical deterioration that's one or the appearance of new lesions or growth of one or more of the existing lesions by 50% uh, at any time during treatment occurring in the context of the lack of progression um, of the overall tumor burden as measured by the sum of um, the, the diameters in up to six lesions any time during treatment. And, and the third one is obviously um, an increase in FTG uptake in one or more lesions with a com without a concomitant increase in lesion or tumor size. So these all suggest potential progression. Um, and, and essentially, you know, the, what, what needs to happen is that, like with the solid tumors, that, you know, a, a repeat uh, scanning as such within 12 weeks of that initial progression that's been suspected needs to occur. And if there's a possibility of uh, doing a bone marrow um, biopsy to confirm progression should occur. Um, I think, uh, and I think uh, basically the, the classification will evolve. And, and as, as with you know, originally in Lugano, um, the provisional terms in terms of um, complete remission and confirmed disappeared. I think the indeterminate response will disappear as as the classification and more data is available. Uh, okay. Uh, so moving on slightly, I, I wanted to throw out another concept. So. You've got your study, you're looking at a study design, and essentially on the cohorts one and two, you've got progression, patients coming in with progression based on who have previously received chemo plus an IO. And then cohorts three and four, you've got patients who are ineligible for some sort of chemo, uh, but have had an, a, a checkpoint inhibitor. They either have or have not benefited, and I've, I've put in another box of all colors. And you have your standard dose escalations, et cetera, but then what happens is that as you move through dose expansion, um, uh, dose escalation to hit an MTD or a biological effective dose, you're looking at these arms. And really, as you go into a recommended phase two dose um, and deciding whether or not going to phase three, you really want to make sure that um, you're looking at the endpoints, you know, and the patients as such. And, you know, you can have various scenarios, but I, I simply kind of presented, you've, you, you're looking at uh, OS in check, 
checkpoint combo with your IO therapy versus IO plus chemo, or you're looking at your um, your, your asset plus a checkpoint versus chemo, and it's important to distinguish that. And what we're finding in some of the um, the solid tumor studies is that each uh, potentially each one of these arms or different patient populations be, almost becomes a phase two, phase three uh, a subset of uh, patients in an overall study. And it's important that really early on that um, some of these distinguishing factors for the patients is, is well understood. And I wanted to throw in another modeling uh, concept that is important. And you know, I, I talked about some of the modeling early on. And if you look at um, this, this slide, and if you look on the right-hand side, and I'm, I'm going to ask you to bear with me such on this one as I try and explain it. So if you look at the curve, X and Y axes represent immuno-oncology drugs, with the DLT in red and the DLT in green in those circles. And unlike monotherapy, MTED is not a single number, but actually but a curve in, in doses A and B, uh, and, and, the, and space, and that's represented by the almost blue river in this example. So the recommended phase two is a point on that MTD curve, giving the maximum tumor growth rate inhibition as a, uh, as a prediction from clinical observations and preclinical modeling. So uh, some of these uh, the studies in the later phase settings, you know, we, we've used population PK, et cetera, to ensure that the assumptions being made in the earlier phase studies are, are, are validated as such. So, okay, so moving on, what does success look like? And, you know, something that we find a number of our biotech uh, development partners are saying is how do you get to, um, you know, uh, fast track or um, get this drug through registration as quickly as possible. And the question comes back to, you know, why do studies fail in a phase three setting? Uh, what, and really it comes down to what's done in the phase one, phase two setting. And with IO, I kind of introduced this term of multiplicity compounding statistical factors that impact the design in a phase three setting. And, you know, with multiple arms, it's almost, as I said previously, you need to factor in that patient population, which population you're looking at. So, on the right hand side, you've got a, you know, in in that phase two confirmatory study as such, you've got a high bar to be set so that you're going to have success in a phase three setting. Um, the point that I haven't mentioned, I think, you know, is critical is the use of uh, biomarkers in tumor tissue and blood assays um, to look at, you know, uh, activity and clinical benefits and adverse event profiles, et cetera. And in summary, you know, you're looking at biomarkers that include change from baseline, you know, their correlation with, and I'll use the example um, for viruses um, and virus PK, safety, efficacy, and other, as such. And what you're doing essentially with biomarkers, you, you have, and I'll, I'll use the virus example, is you're looking at essentially cytokine levels in the blood you know, analyze the tumor tissue or, or for uh, genomic or gene expression uh, using it and immunohistostaining for uh, for immunofluorescence analysis. Um, and predictive biomarkers in terms of the vaccine, is it delivered to the tumor, the virus genome, as I explained, explained replication, expression in transgenes, um, and the assess the potential in uh, of the virus in the blood plasma serum levels etc any mucosal buccal mucosa uh, linings etc urine and stools um the other part in terms of neutralizing antibodies etc and um titers using cellular infectivity assays so all of these play a part in terms of what are your strengths and weaknesses what what, what in a study and are you really going to get a successful outcome and to prevent any false positives and negatives. So I guess a lot of the challenges, Luca, kind of not only like I talked about in terms of the combination and which combination you use, but also the sequencing of those going forward. Right, and, and, and it is a challenge, but it's important 
you know, discussion points at that early phase when we when we engage some of our clients to talk about the patient populations and really show the drugs working at that tumor site and the patient populations how they differentiate as such as you move through through a study and get that safety profile. Look for efficacy. Yeah, and you know, picking the right response criteria is always important. Um, one that's going to be giving you a proof of concept as early as possible, right? Uh, but equally, one that then potentially, if you've got an expansion cohort into phase two, that could get your breakthrough therapy, get you a license or a conditional approval. Um, and if we look at the examples today, if you look at CISA, uh, then the they use the NCCN criteria for the the B A C C A L L. Um, interestingly, they had an independent review committee of three people, three independent assessors going through this data, a, lot, a bit like an adjudication committee, and so this information is quite uh, important in terms of how we run the study to make sure that we get the comprehensive, clean data to the review committee in time. If we look at actually in their diffuse large B cell, then that's certainly much more traditional in terms of using the Chesson criteria back from 2007. Yes, there was an independent review as there is in um, traditionally in uh, imaging and making sure, but that's a batched review by an independent imaging review provider. And we've certainly seen in some early studies we've worked on where a client has had perhaps had their early data and we look at the waterfall plot, we see patients who actually had a complete response not showing up as a complete response because there wasn't any shrinkage in the tumour or perceived tumour which actually scar tissue. But actually, of course, when we have this PET image, then we can see no activity at all. So in reality for that patient, it is a complete response. Um, if we look at the, some of the vaccine therapy in the early stage considerations, well, well, traditionally we use three times the three plus three cohort to go to um, the MTD. Of course, we start with a very, very low dose, and these are conducted in advanced patients whose immune status may not be the optimal for the, being treated with these kind of therapies. But tumor vaccines, often based on on DNA or, or viral vectors, that have already been tested, so there may not be a need to do any safety or tolerability studies. Clearly, if you have a novel virus or a plas new plasmid, then they need to be evaluated for safety. Um, so the dose escalation design might be appropriate, but actually, as we said, those patients' immune systems may have been compromised. So maximum dose as well might be compromised by feasibility of production, for example. Um, or even location of production, as we might see later on uh, in terms of the spread of these studies. So perhaps uh, a novel approach to the early phase design of cancer vaccine by Korn et al. is looking at a sequential procedure, looking to find the biologically active dose. Um, so really increasing in cohorts until we see more dose responses. So maybe cohorts of three patients, if we do not see a biological response in the early phases or you only see one response out of three, then escalate that dose until we get two to three responses. And then you might expand that cohort. And when you get five to six responses, that could be your biologically active level with which to move forward. So talk about safety considerations. Now, Luke mentioned about safety considerations. Now, these do impact trial design, they impact our management of patients and managing their safety and it's um, upon us all to manage patient safety and protect their safety within studies. So just handing over to Luke what's been seen in these specific studies we've talked about earlier. Yeah, I think I've gone over this quite a bit, but essentially that cytokine release syndrome is a key event and, you know, and um, the, the, the prolonged cytopenia as such. And, you know, ensuring that, you know, anti-cytokine drugs, treatment and tolicosam and corticosteroids steroids are available as such. And, you know, eight percent of these patients were intubated, by the way. And, you know, that's a serious um, uh, condition, obviously, and it, it's important that 
really we we we're using the right sites, the right teams, etc., to pick up on that. And uh, you know, essentially, uh, you're looking at a durable clinical be benefit with a safety profile in, with with, um, with the CTLL one nine as such. Yeah, so I mean, they're well known associations with serious toxicity, and uh, it is a challenge, particularly. Uh, I find when we're reviewing criteria with our excellent team of medical writing group as well, looking at some of these DLTs are actually already listed as frequent events within product labels if they're in partner drugs. So we really need to be clear about the dose limiting toxicities and maybe have adjudication of those as well. So regular safety review meetings and a daily safety monitoring board. Um, Combination studies, this is recognized in the EMA guidance, are likely to increase that. So again, that's adding extra caution. Even going back to early days when I was working on one of the first IO monoclonal antibodies, Rituxan, Rituximab, um, we needed to define in the protocol prophylactic man measures, management of dose adjustments, and also if there's any partner medications, uh, chemotherapeutics, what happens to those if you need to make a dose adjustment or which ones you make dose adjustments for? This sounds very pedantic, but these are things that can make or break a protocol in terms of making sure it can be logistically put in, as well as, of course, protecting the safety of patients. What are those events that need to be reported immediately? Uh, just to give you this for reference in terms of the severe side effects uh, seen in CAR-T studies, this is a selection of those with the reported deaths, but also those reported neurological toxicities, which are important as well. And what, how can we overcome these safety challenges in the future um, in terms of design? Well, let's look at concomitant medications. Which concomitant medications, including conditioning regimens, are being used? This is going to greatly affect a patient's uh, side effect profile. What disease is being studied and how many prior lines of therapy? Um, what is the current disease burden? Again, we used to see this with Rituxan and patients with a very large tumor or large circulating tuber in the case of the CLL, for example, had more chance of the first dose reactions. The design of the car as well is going to potentially have an effect in the future. Um, and there's new car T's which will have potentially integrated safety switches that can be turned on by adding another medication. Um, so stopping the CAR T's or killing the CAR T's as they exist, and then hopefully stopping the CAR T toxicity. Again, I just want to draw your attention to this um, reference. Uh, it's a group, the CAR Tox group, which has a detailed guidance on how to give, manage patients. This is relevant to our clinical trials because Clearly, those patients coming in need to be followed up within hospital, within a high dependency or intensive care unit following the administration of their CAR T's mm -hmm. because we're looking particularly to provide supportive care and early diagnosis in CRS cytochrome release syndrome or CRES, the CAR T related encephalopathy syndrome. Um, or these patients are prone to. Selecting sites, we've touched on as well, and this is important. If we look at where current sites are, there's a, there's a preponderance to using sites in the US um, and in China. And if we look at the heat map, particularly for CAR-Ts, there's, there's less so done in Europe. Um, particularly when we're looking at experienced sites that we've worked with, looking for this FACT certification, Foundation for the Accreditation of Cellular Therapy Research. Um, so what are the reasons for this discordance and how can we overcome it? Well, if we look at Europe, uh, and sorry for stating the obvious, but Europe is a number of countries, whilst there is clearly um, cohesion in terms of authorization of products and some cohesion in terms of approval, if, for example, going through the BHP process, still with our gene therapies, there's a number of different ways that countries classify whether it's this environmental risk assessment approach or summary notification approach. Um, you can see uh, some examples there. In addition, just outside of traditional bodies like ethics committees, uh, like health uh, agencies and regulatory agencies, in some countries there are other bodies that you need to notify. So just an example here of our experience in the Netherlands. The, these are the areas that need to be notified. The Ministry of Health, Welfare and Sport. 
um, Ministry of Infrastructure, an Environmental Office for Genetically Modified Organisms, and the Commission on Genetic Modification. And Luke, I think you've got some experience here you wanted to share. Yeah, I, I mean, as we went through the programme of CAR Ts that we were, you know, got, got off the ground, our regulatory experts were um, virtually in daily contact with the sponsors to. Uh, fill out the uh, submissions, both in ethics in terms of regulatory submissions as well. And really, you, you have to allow additional time. It does take longer to complete the submissions dossiers, but also, you know, the number of questions and information that goes in is far more intense. And um, it, it's critical that's factored into any timelines and pathways, and you really do get the experts that become hand in hand and working together as such. And, um, and that kind of translates into, you know, as the teams are ready to get the studies off the ground and initiate sites. We we have seen, you know, the response officers came to us, but they've gone to got lots of sites and uh, <coughs> essentially got to the last hurdle and found they can't actually do the study because they don't have uh, the processes in place to manage any vaccines or gene therapy and such. So there is strong competition, as we showed earlier, with the over 2,000 studies going on. Um, one of the things, again, we like to do, even prior to writing the protocol or even study design, is look at this recruitment modeling concept. So taking epidemiology data, our own investigator experience, look at competitive landscape, uh, country experience, uh, electric health record data, which can actually go down to the number of lines of therapy patients have received before, to really robust modeling. And as Luke said earlier about patient engagement, now patient engagement starts with the clinical planning. It's not just recruitment and retention tools, but clearly that is important. So the area I'd like to point out here is getting patient and advocacy groups involved early on, even at the pre-IND stage, to discuss and support endpoints and your endpoint classifications. Also thinking about basics, going through with your clinical team the sites, looking at the sites from the parking, ease of parking, where could the carers stay, where's the locations of hotels, uh, support for eating, drinking, restaurants, can be all done and supported with patient concierge services when these patients are staying in hospital for a long time. So Lisa, just going to hand you back quickly for the last poll question before we just address the last things. That's great. Thank you. So audience, please participate in our last and final polling question. And you know what to do. Pick your answer and hit submit. Which geography have you prioritized for your regulatory strategy? Is it North America, Europe, North America, and Europe in parallel, or Asia? And again, which geography have you prioritized for your regulatory strategy? North America, Europe, North America, and Europe in parallel, or Asia, and just click on the best answer and hit submit, and we'll just give you a few more seconds for that, and then we can um, get to the last slides of the webcast. Great. Thanks very much, Lisa. So sure. uh, as we kind of expect, that, um, you know, there is a focus in terms of people looking at U.S. single region, single country, uh, biggest market. But of course, I want to put a little plug in for Europe in a second. But looking at accelerated pathways with gene therapies, this RMAT designation, regenerative medicine advanced therapy, something that really is a precursor for certain gene therapy products, to take advantage of accelerated pathways later on. So to go down the fast track route, accelerated approval route, for example. Um, of course, don't forget orphan designation as well. Um, orphan designation can be applied separately or actually joint between Europe and the US as well. Here's some existing RMAT approvals. Um, another point on orphan designation, given that that can actually raise company valuation by on average 4%. So it's often done very early. It can be done any time really in the life cycle, but it's often done early. Regulatory options in Europe, accelerated assessment to reduce that time frame conditional marketing author authorization. Conversation I've had with European regulators is that perhaps not enough people are taking advantage of this, where you can really get an approval on limited data until you continue to provide gaps in that data. There's an annual review. Compassionate use as well, uh, looking at a pan uh, European support to give early access to medicines. And prime priority medicine designation, which gives approval and, and support in terms of accelerated assessment. 
early rapporteur appointed and early advice and a dedicated contact person at the EMA. Just one point as well, these are not mutually exclusive pathways. You can have prime and of course have these other pathways as well, as well as your orphan drug designation. And I think certainly looking at even if you plan your sites in one region or another, making sure you've got a regulatory development plan primed, ready to go in another region, can add value to your organization, can accelerate in terms of your clinical trials later on. So just, just to wrap this discussion up, um, you know, we've discussed today and we've introduced you to gene therapy technology in the heme space, how a mode of action and nuances of technology implementation. We really looked at uh, immunology, CAR T products and vaccines, how they uh, impact planning and design strategies. We touched upon the data-driven approaches for site selection and patient engagement strategies. And finally, we rounded off with some regulatory pathways. Um, Colin, anything else you want to no, just as uh, I think there's some practical aspects, some sort of top line strategic as well as some detail there. Just um, maybe just looking at one of the questions quickly. You touched on it a little bit, Luke. Um, are there any lessons we can take from immuno oncology measure in your IO molecules in solid tumors and take those into hematology and vice versa? Is there any lessons we should take forward? Uh, yes, absolutely. In, in terms of, you know, the, the key component is, you know, what, what are your patients? The early phase studies really where, you know, don't diverge from safety. Safety is ultimate. But then, obviously, finding the right dose combination and safety profile. What we're seeing is, you know, will IOIO versus IO and chemo be more effective or will it have less of a toxicity profile? I think that's the unknown question and, mm -hmm. and the lesson learned is, you know, watch the space, I think. Yeah, well, I'm certainly excited to see some of these therapies that are perhaps applied late on. They may, I, I guess, be failing because patients' immune systems have been ruined with earlier chemotherapeutics. What happens if we gave them earlier on? Would it be more toxicity? Could we actually offload that with more uh, efficacy? And I think the combinations with drugs like pembrolizumab mm -hmm. have potential to vastly increase the efficacy. Of course, we're going to have to watch that toxicity profile, the CRS, the CRES, and the HLH very carefully indeed. Yeah. So um, I think flip side is, are they priming the patients ready for, you know, a better treatment as they go into, you know, some of these early phase studies? Precisely, and uh, you know, one of the challenges we always face as a rituxan when we have such effective drugs on or coming to the market is, do you treat them with a more effective upfront, or do, and then I know some hematologists like to keep the, something effective in their back pocket for when that patient has a remission, uh, sorry, a relapse, and comes back in to see them. So I think on that note, uh, we'd like to thank everybody for their attendance, and I'll hand back to Lisa. Thank you so much, Colin, and thank you so much, Luke, for your very informative presentations, and thank you for taking um, that question. Um, I wanted to, uh, a, another question to come in during the discussion, and I wanted to quickly ask you, um, do you think, and I know you were discussing this, but I wanted to just make sure that we covered it. Which combinations do you think could be applicable to CAR-T, and what are the challenges of investigating the combination therapies? I know you were talking about that with the other area, but um, how about in CAR-T? Well, I think, absolutely. Maybe I can start, Luke. Um, I, I, one of the major challenges is going to be toxicity. I think one of the major challenges, it simply comes down to logistics in terms of which partner do you go with, which checkpoint inhibitor, which PDL one could you partner with. A lot of the times it will come to personal relationships with the organizations, um, not necessarily just early uh, preclinical efficacy data as well. And I think, you know, there's some clear challenges in cost. The cost of partner molecules will be off-putting to a large number of people. And I think, Luke, you've had experience of this recently, looking at costing with a partnering with a, a checkpoint inhibitor. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. And, and I think, you know, touching on Colin's point, the cost of the checkpoints are very, very expensive. And if you're looking at a large phase two study, you know, you're talking several millions just to providing the comparator. But ultimately, I, I think, you know, the, the, the modeling that we talked about and getting that preclinical 
clinical data in terms of are the checkpoint inhibitors working differently, uh, you know, nivolumab, atomizumab, are, are they working differently with the combination or in a particular therapy area? And I think that's the key, and, and, and it's not a blanket goal for one or another. They do work differently. They do um, uh, target the tumors differently, the infiltration, et cetera. Some of the drugs like IPP may uh, get more of a separation of the curve earlier on than later. So it's, it's important that this is explored in, in terms of the animal models and early phase work as well. So, so we'll maybe hand back to you, Lisa, with the 12 seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you both for your uh, your insights and your expertise in applying that to um, the questions as well as your presentation. It was very interesting. And I want to thank the audience for participating in the polls and, and offering those questions. And I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Premier Research, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through February of next year. You will receive an email from Applied Clinical Trials alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay, and we invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. And thank you again, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.